In this video, we're going to look at managing sample size and characteristics. So when we're talking about sample size, it is the size of the sample we draw from our population is where we get our estimates of error and our precision and, and, uh, and our margin of error. So it doesn't matter what the population size is. It doesn't matter how many people in the population. It's the sample size that matters. That's what gives us our accuracy as to how representative we can be in the conclusions we make. In general, um, when you've got a population that has doesn't have a lot of homophily, it's called everyone, everyone's not the same. If you've got a population where there's a wide variation in characteristics, where there's a lot of different characteristics, characteristics present. So for us, we're looking at things like attitudes and opinions and sentiments. So all of those things, when we know there's a greater variation in the population, then we need a larger sample size. Larger sample size, more accurate our, our, our results will be, and we can make better accurate generalizations about the population. So those are guidelines. There's some general rules to think about, and one of those general rules, there are exceptions to these, of, of course, and there's some context that, that you'll want to weigh, but generally a larger sample size will mean more accuracy. It'll reduce the margin of error. So if you're surveying 500 versus surveying 1700, you want to go with the 1700 sample because that's going to give you lower margin of error and a better ability to make generalizations about the, the population. And that's the second point. Generally, the larger it is, the, the better able you are to make more precise estimates. Um, and in particular, when you want to break those results down into subgroups. So, for example, if we're talking about vote intention and we want to look at the population across different demographic groups, different age groups, in order to do that, to, to, uh, to, to break our results down, to, to try and figure out, okay, what, what are people are voting for that are over 50? What about 18 to 34? If we want to start breaking down our, our sample sizes, or excuse me, our results, the sample size has to be large in order to get those subgroup estimates. So when you're looking at different uh, different breakdowns like sex category or age then you want to have a big enough sample size that it gives you meaningful estimates within those subgroups another point within small populations so the, the, the population you're surveying is small it's not particularly large you really need to have uh, a high proportion of the population in order to get decent estimates within your margin of error. So you, you again, the smaller the population, you actually need to cover more of them because it's just uh, the nature of the beast. The larger population, you can have a random sample and get a pretty decent estimate. So if you're sampling folks, there is a concern that certain characteristics may be dominant based on different con uh, contextual factors or different bias that may be built in. And that would lead us to want to try and control this uh, overrepresentation or underrepresentation of certain characteristics so we can make better estimates about our population. One problem is within households. We were often targeting households when we do surveys. So the census, it's households. Um, phone calls to landlines, that's households. But really, we're after people. We want to talk to individuals. You can't, you, you don't analyze the household as a unit. We want individual people. So if that happens, we're knocking on doors or we're calling landlines and we're getting households with lots of people. How do we ensure that each person has an equal chance of being selected as the respondent? Because we know that at certain times of day, for example, if we're walking around knocking on doors in the middle of the day, we're going to get a lot of retirees answering the door. And so that's going to be problematic for our sample. Everybody we sample is going to be retired doesn't do us very good if we want to make generalizations about the entire population. So we need to think about that when we're surveying households. How do we ensure that we're going to get a decent random sample so that we don't get one characteristic dominant, like the one type of person that's going to answer the phone or answer the door could be, uh, they, they could all have some characteristic in common. Different ways of doing that. There are approaches, there's three different approaches. We'll talk about the Kish method the Rizzo method and the birthday methods. These are ways of when you call a house or you knock on a door of trying to figure out how to randomly select somebody to survey instead of picking the old retired grandpa that happened to open the door because they had nothing else to do. 
how are you able to ensure that you don't just survey grandpas rather than uh, getting a good picture of everybody? So just for uh, for background, the Kish method, what it does is you you go to the the door or you, or you call them, call the house, and whoever answers, ask them to provide a list of everybody that's in the house, and then describe them, and you write them down in a little matrix, and that matrix will give you a number to pick, and one of those numbers happens to be the person you select. So it's a weird way of of, of doing it, and it's uh, it's kind of burdensome. It's uh, time intensive, and it's and it's sometimes complicated to do. It's very complicated to do over the phone. So that's a drawback, but it's a good way of ensuring that you, you've got a, a a decent probability of selecting everybody because you kind of put them all into a list into this this matrix, and then there's you you look at another sheet. It's got a number, and you go to the graph, and you pick the number, and you pick the person that corresponds with that number. So it's blind. It's random. It works. Rizzo, uh, similar, you just ask for every adult in the house and you pick one of them randomly. So again, both of these aren't great because they are, they're just time intensive and they're tough to do over the phone, but they are probability based. The birthday method is when you ask for the person that's maybe got the birthday closest to January or it might be the birthday closest to the, the day that you're calling or the day that you're knocking on the doors. And so that's kind of probability, we call it quasi-probability, may not be that accurate, but in terms of ease of use, anybody can do it. Anybody can casually figure out, you know, whether they've got the earliest birthday or the latest birthday or whatever the metric happens to be. So pretty good in terms of ease of use. You can also use um, non-probability methods. So you've got probability-based, quasi-probability, and the non-probability-based this may be where you just ask, hey, does anybody have an opinion on the upcoming election? I'll pick that person. Sometimes it's a good idea because that you're you're picking somebody that has knowledge of the situation. They've they've got some some information to offer. If you've got a, a household that happens to be very politically active, there's five people and one of them doesn't care about politics, then you you happen to pick them to to, to answer. Maybe that's not going to give you an accurate picture. So you want to find out who's got the most knowledge, who's the most likely to vote, if it's a market research, who's going to make the purchasing decisions in the household, who has used the product, all of those things. Those are non-probability, but you may want to do it just for for the, for the sake of getting getting responses, meaningful responses you can use. That doesn't always do the trick in terms of getting us samples that are truly representative of our population. Sometimes we get a disconnect. Sometimes the, this sort of bias happens where we sample too many folks with a given characteristic or not enough with another characteristic. We get too many retired grandpas opening the doors, not enough uh, stay-at-home moms answering their phone, whatever it happens to be. We don't get an accurate representation. So what we can turn to and what many researchers tend to or turn to is weighting. And a weight is a mathematical adjustment you make to your sample to account for those different probabilities of selection or to correct for these differences in, in non-responses. So these certain characteristics that are left out because of these non-response biases. Now, the weighting error is the error that you get with that. So when you try to make a mathematical adjustment to your sample, that's going to change your, your estimate because of just that, that, that weighting that you're doing. You're going to introduce another element of error, another way that you can go wrong. So what do I mean by weighting? You will hear this. Samples are weighted. You'll see it in the methodology statements. Samples were weighted to ensure something. Here's a quick and dirty example of what they mean when they say weighting. So here we've got a population. I'm surveying these folks. Maybe it's about vote intention. Maybe it's about safety on campus or study habits or people that live um, on a busy street. Who knows? But I know that my population has 30% of it in the 18 to 34 age bracket. I've got 40% of them, 35 to 49, and then 50 plus, 30% of my population. So that I know that that's the breakdown of my population. I run through, I do a survey, and my sample is not great because my sample actually has 60% of my respondents were in that lowest age group. 30% were, were in the middle, and that's closer. That's 30 to 40, that's in the ballpark. But only 10% of my, my sample were in, in the 50 plus age group. So we can look right away and see that that is way off. I've got 10% in my sample, 
but that's 30% of my population. So I'm going to, any generalization I make is going to be off because I know I'm missing a lot of people in that 50 plus age group. Similarly, in the 18 to 34, I've gotten way too many. I've got way too many of these folks responding. And so it's going to, when I do make generalizations, I'll be counting their votes and their responses too much compared to what they actually make up of the population. So by weighting my results, what I would do is I would go through and, and do some math and adjust the responses that I get from each of these groups. So for example, if I look at my 18 to 34 age group, when I do the quick math, I, I divide my population percentage by my sample percentage, I get a number of 0 0.5. Essentially what that says is that I would need to cut my sample in half to have it accurately represent the population. So I would do that. I would take all my responses from that subgroup of my sample and I would multiply them by 0 0.05 and I would use that as my weighted response. Over down at the other end of the spectrum, the 50 plus, I, I do the same math. I would actually need to multiply by 3 because I need it to triple. I need to triple my sample results to get it to equal the population. So that's what we're doing when we're weighting. You're, 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 you're adjusting the math, you're doing some math to change the, the actual sample to make it look more like the population. So why do you want to do this? Well, again, you want to ensure that the final sample represents the target population as close as you can get. Because inevitably, there's going to be some sampling error, so you want to try and, and mitigate that. Now, there's non-response adjustments. So as, as we've been, been speaking about, if there's certain groups that you know aren't going to respond, by waiting, you can help amplify their voice in your, your final survey results because uh, it'll try and alleviate that non-response bias. Waiting is complicated and it doesn't always give you the right estimates. It may help in some areas but hurt with others. And I can give you two examples that tie in with that and tie in with the previous point. The 2016 presidential election. It was very hard to get responses from Hispanic-speaking households. So what they, do, they did was wait. You would wait those respondents, wait those samples based on what you presume to be the, the makeup of the population of, of voters on election day. So they would account for that non-response group. On the other hand, they would also find when they're doing polling that the responses they were getting in terms of people with a college education and, and those without did not line up with what they thought their population was going to be. They assumed that they were not getting enough folks with college degrees, college education, responding. So they weighted that to give them uh, what they thought was a more accurate uh, re representation of the population. Turns out on voting day that wasn't the case because the actual electorate was not as educated as they thought. So they, they were looking at a population, they thought they had a good breakdown of it, and it was the sample that was actually correct which is why we, we saw some uh, controversy about polling being off and, and a big surprise victory. Well, that was part of the reason right there is because polling firms were doing some waiting to amplify the voice of these college-educated voters, and they didn't need to because on Election Day they didn't get as many uh, college-educated voters. So the, the population that they were working with, the model of the population, was not accurate. So, in summary... We want larger sample size. We can make better generalizations about our population. It's challenging to do that. We will sometimes get characteristics that come through a little louder than we would like and some that are not loud enough. And we, we have different ways of trying to do that. And one of those is survey weighting. And we can try and weight our surveys, but again, that doesn't always give us uh, the most accurate representation of our population.